What I want to do is tell you a little bit about Northern Ireland and our equality journey in the hope that um, our journey resonates with, with you in Israel. Northern Ireland is of course known the world over for its sectarian conflict and thankfully has more recently become known for its process of conflict resolution. Inequality and especially employment inequality was a key element of our conflict and the design and the implementation of significant equality protections have been key elements of our conflict resolution. Well, my objective today is to outline the progress made and in particular, the factors which have contributed to our progress. It's my hope that Northern Ireland's equality journey will resonate with some of the issues in Israel and that some of our learning will be of assistance as Israel continues and sometimes struggles and stumbles on its equality journey. I hope in particular to draw on our experience in pursuing equality in times of conflict, especially our identification of the importance of a good and harmonious working environment and the steps taken with employers to ensure worker safety. First of all, let me tell you a little bit about Northern Ireland. Northern Ireland is very small. It's composed of only six counties in the northeast of Ireland. It's small and our population is just 1.8 million. Of course, our equality matters, not unlike many places worldwide, have a long history. In the 16th century, English and Scottish families were settled in the Irish province of Ulster. The lands of the native Irish were redistributed to the newly arrived settlers who were from a different country and of a different religion. The Act of Settlement in 1801 formalised the Union of Ireland with England, Scotland and Wales. It wasn't a great success because it was followed by successive attempts to overthrow the Union. Finally, in 1921, an Act was passed providing for a two-state solution. Uh, a 26-county Irish state and six counties within Northern Ireland which remain within the United Kingdom. The six northern states had a Protestant majority and the northern government exhibited a general mistrust of Roman Catholics whom they saw as disloyal and they expressly encouraged business owners to employ good Protestant lads and lassies. Um, perhaps now we could run these. So that is our small area. And you will see that the distribution between Roman Catholics is increasingly a similar number of each. Yeah. It's rather nice, and in particular we have some absolutely lovely buildings. The first one, our opera house, one of our cathedrals, our Titanic memorial, um, and these are the walls of Derry. Um, we have a strong history of industry um, and some of the te new, new technology. Farming is still very important to us and these are our famous cranes called Samson and Goliath. It is a naturally beautiful place, even if we do have exceptionally bad weather. Um, so you see the Jan's Causeway, um, the uh, uh, Mountains of Mourne, uh, this is Carn Lock in the Antrim Hills. Um, we're good at golf. Um, we write wonderful poetry. We have good movie actors. And in previous times, we were very good at football. And of course, we can race horses. And this is one of our most recent photographs where uh, Sinn Féin, um, an Irish um, Sinn Féin minister, meets the Queen and shakes her hand. So that was kind of a big challenge for us, that the two sides of our conflict would actually shake hands. Okay, so let me tell you about equality matters. Um, issues of employment inequality were at the heart of our conflict. And during the period of the local devolved government, that's from 21 to 72, complaints of religious discrimination against the Catholic community in particular were a recurrent theme. In summary, the complaints were about three things. Jobs, 
housing and votes. And in the late 1960s and 1970s, the complaints of employment inequality were given weight by analyses by academics and political activists. The patterns in the labour market made clear that there was unfairness against Catholics in both the public and the private sector. Importantly, detailed analysis of the 71 population census provided clear evidence of labour market disadvantage in both public and private employments. At that time, of course, we had had major outbreaks of civil disturbance. And so the local Northern Ireland government was suspended by the UK government and it reinstated direct rule from London. London had also, in 1972, asked a Minister of State, William Van Strabenzi, a Conservative man, to consider if there was a need for intervention on matters of discrimination. He recommended that a system of quotas be rejected, but that direct rule should be accompanied by the introduction of comprehensive religious anti-discrimination legislation. And the first legislation which focused on equality and grounds of religion um, reflected the two main ethno-political communities and it was introduced in 1976. At the same time, Northern Ireland also introduced gender equality legislation and two commissions, the Fair Employment Agency and the Equal Opportunities Commission were established at that time. The 76 legislation um, was similar to the legislation introduced in London um, by the Commission for Racial Equality, which dealt um, with racial matters in Britain. We at that time had so few people of colour or black or brown that we brought in no legislation about racial discrimination. Um, but there was one significant difference in the religious discrimination um, in terms of the powers. The Fair Employment Agency did not have to have a belief of discrimination before it could commence an investigation. And the agency used its investigative powers widely. It looked at large sections of the public and private sectors. And in many instances, found workforces were frequently imbalanced in terms of religion. And accordingly, it made recommendations to improve practices. For example, word of mouth recruitment, that is where you say to your existing workers, do you know anybody who wants a job? Um, uh, word of mouth recruitment and uh, recruiting from members of the family um, were replaced with recruitment practices based on merit, including the identification of necessary qualifications and experience, and the widespread advertising of vacancies. And of particular importance was the FEA investigation of the Northern Ireland Civil Service, which held itself up as a model of good practice. But the investigation found significant failures to implement the good practice recommendations of the agency. And the report was a major shock given the stated commitment to equality for all. The civil service quickly moved to implement comprehensive equality protections, and if it was going to do them, it was going to encourage all others in the public service, such as the district councils, to do likewise. A further important driver came from outside our country, and that was the campaign for strengthened equality protections called the McBride Campaign, a United States-based group of Irish Americans which urged the companies who operated in Northern Ireland to adopt a series of principles called the McBride Principles. And, that, and then in the US, it urged state and city legislatures to endorse the principles. And these local legislatures pressurised companies operating in Northern Ireland to commit to the principles or they would withdraw their, their investments. The McBride Principles were described as positive, legal, moderate means of contributing to the elimination of discrimination. The principles recognised that civil disturbances, which were very regular at that time, had introduced tensions within workplaces, and that further disturbances outside the immediate vicinity of a workplace were an obvious disincentive to a member of an underrepresented group to take up employment. Accordingly, one of the principles expressly said, adequate security for the protection of minority employees both at the workplace and while travelling to and from work. And that was clarified to mean, while total security can be guaranteed nowhere today in Northern Ireland, each signatory to McBride must make reasonable good faith efforts to protect workers against intimidation and physical abuse in the workplace. Signatories must also make reasonable good faith efforts to ensure that applicants are not deterred from seeking employment because of fear for their personal safety. 
an important second principle required the banning of provocative religious or political emblems from the workplace. Each signatory to McBride must make reasonable good faith efforts to prevent a display of provocative emblems at their plants in Northern Ireland. As I say, this was all done by a group of campaigners, but the government then in Great Britain was very concerned by the McBride campaign. In particular, it was concerned that both at home and internationally, it was portrayed as doing not enough to establish substantive equality. And it feared that the McBride campaign could in fact deter investors and the US pension funds would divest in Northern Ireland. So the UK government recognized the need to act proactively itself to address ongoing employment inequality. And an additional driver for stronger legislation was the evidence from the investigations which the FEA had carried out. And the UK government had also been pressurised to reform by the Irish government signing them after it had signed the mutual Anglo-Irish agreement. And the European Union also sought further uh, um, in attention. A review by SACR, the Standing Advisory Commission on Human Rights, had also uh, concluded that uh, extensive reform was required. But of course, first and foremost, there was an economic rationale for an improved labour market, as the operation of restrictive employment practices was not conducive to issues of productivity and growth. There was evidence at that time that the reputation of Northern Ireland for unfair equality and for workplaces which were characterised by disharmony dissuaded foreign investors from setting up in the area. So by the late 1980s, it was apparent that major reform was necessary to bring about substantive employment equality if the economy, a successful economy, was to be achieved. The UK government agreed to strengthen the um, requirements for equality and grounds of religion. And in 1989, we got legislation which had been strongly influenced by Canadian um, federal employment equity policy. This incorporated r rigorous monitoring of employees and although it permitted affirmative action, it did not go as far as quotas. The new Northern Ireland provisions required all employers, public and private, who had 11 or more employees to monitor the religious composition of their employment, both full-time and part-time, and their applicants, and they continue to this day. So we have now had something like 24 years of monitoring reports. The um, provisions are not just for Roman Catholics who are traditionally more underrepresented, but apply to those of other religions and none. Every job seeker in Northern Ireland is asked the following question. Are you a member of the Protestant community, the Roman Catholic community, or neither? And employers every year are required to send to us, the Equality Commission, a monitoring return specifying the composition of the workforce by community background, sex and occupational grouping. It often surprises people across the world that those questions asked of every employee are freely answered. But since monitoring was first introduced in 1990, the vast majority of employees have identified themselves as belonging to the Protestant or Roman Catholic community. Indeed, the proportion of those who have, for whom it was not possible to determine a community background has only ranged from about 5.6% to 7% um, uh, at present. Now, of course, across the world, the level of religiosity falls. But in Northern Ireland, religion is more than just your personally held religion belief. It's about the community to which you belong. So when people answer the question, I'm a member of the Protestant community, that's not, as I say, just about their religion. It's about their community. Employers are also under a duty to determine if the composition exhibits fair participation. In other words, every employer must ask themselves, in light of the known factors, um, such as who is living in a reasonable travel to work area, is the composition of my workforce and my recent recruits, as revealed by monitoring, broadly in line with what might reasonably be expected? And if the answer to that question is no, that is one community is underrepresented, the employer must adopt practices to encourage fair participation. Employers cannot use reverse discrimination, but they can reach out to underrepresented communities to encourage members of that community to apply for jobs. 
um, in advance of these provisions, I regularly met employers who said, I'm open to all, but they don't come. But now employers cannot use that. Employers must actually reach out to members of the community who are underrepresented. Employers can provide training for those who are underrepresented to fit them for, to apply for jobs. We call these the active equality duties, and they were almost entirely accepted and adopted by employers. People always say things, employers won't do that, it's too difficult. But employers will, because employers like clarity. Once the legislation said, you must do this, and every other employer must do this, they also went, right, done, let's get on with it. The new body, the Fair Employment Commission, must provide with additional money and staff to assist employers to comply by providing guidance and support. And it has been exceptionally rare that the Commission has had to make use of its very strong powers because employers have willingly made use voluntarily of their permitted powers. The provisions have worked. They've achieved the desired outcome in that the Roman Catholic share of the workforce as a whole has increased by about half a percentage point each year since 2001. So that overall now, the religious composition of the workforce accurately reflects the composition of those available for work. And the impact of the fair employment regime has been the subject of detailed analysis by academics. These have concluded that monitoring provisions and the review and the affirmative action agreements have been successful. Um, secondly, we've also seen a significant increase in the numbers of integrated workplaces. That is, workplaces where Protestants and Roman Catholic work together. Um, and the number of single identity workplaces which pre-existed have decreased considerably. Um, I now want to talk to you specifically um, about a good and harmonious working environment. But before I do that, I wanted to show some more pictures about how we in Northern Ireland exhibit our difference. An important change which followed the equality legislation was in relation to the nature of the working environment, and in particular, the regulation of flags and emblems within the workplace. Before the 1990 legislation, it was common for workplaces in Northern Ireland to have a large number of union flags and loyalist emblems on display, especially in July, a month when it has been traditional for Protestants to celebrate the victory of William of Orange at the Battle of the Boyne. Protestants remember this battle of 1690 as a great victory over the Catholic King James. And the celebrations in July each year play a critical role in awareness of unionism and also in the ongoing tensions in Northern Ireland. Displays were commonplace, especially in heavy engineering and manufacturing sectors. And these displays set the tone of our place for the Protestants and left Catholic workers in doubt that the workplace was primarily for Protestants. There were also some workplaces where symbols of Catholic and nationalist culture were frequent, and in these, Protestant workers felt anxious and concerned about safety. Working with employers to establish harmonious environments was a key objective of the Fair Employment Commission established after the 1990 legislation. The code of practice which we designed required employers to promote a good and harmonious working environment. And that was defined as an atmosphere where no worker feels under threat or intimidated because of his or her religious belief or political opinion. With this advice behind them, employers worked with employee representatives and trade unions to get flags down. Workplaces now are almost always free of flags. Furthermore, the structures put in place to deal with flags have given many employers the confidence to ban sexually explicit posters, for example, and I would strongly recommend that every employer gives consideration to the question, does my workplace display a harmonious environment? Or does it make a member of a minority group feel isolated rather than welcome. The code of practice has been very influential and the drive to replace sectarian workplaces with good and harmonious ones was significantly supported by the judicial decisions of the tribunal. In our code of practice, we explicitly state that in order to promote equality, an employer should promote a good and harmonious environment. It should prohibit the display of flags, emblems, posters, graffiti, 
the circulation of materials, or we're keen on this in Northern Ireland, the deliberate articulation of slogans or songs which are likely to give offence or cause apprehension among particular groups of employees. There were many workplaces where this guidance was a significant challenge to the existing practice. For example, I remember a textile and sewing company where it was necessary for the employer with the support of the commission and with the help of the trade union to work directly with workers and tell them that the union flags could no longer be displayed on every sewing machine throughout the factory. Similarly, in a large engineering company, the practice of allowing a loyal Protestant order band to practice their music over the lunchtime period had to be prohibited. Employers who failed to create a harmonious environment were challenged in the tribunal and a number of us say decisions were in favour of minority employees and substantial remedies were granted. When an employer fails to ensure a working environment and an employee was su subjected to sectarian harassment either from other employees or clients or sometimes those outside the workforce, the employer was found to have unlawfully discriminated. Importantly, the legislation provided that employers are liable for acts of their employees. Employers could not offer the defence, it wasn't me, it was other workers. This clearly outlaw outlawed harassment by someone in a position of power or management who is using their position in an abusive way. For example, the shop manager, the head office, when they did nothing to intervene, that made the employer liable. When such cases came to be adjudicated upon in the tribunal, um, we stressed the code and in particular the requirement of a proactive rather than a reactive policy. I'll tell you about one or two cases. One case of particular note was that of Brennan versus Shorts, a case as long ago as 1995. The complainant was Mr. Brennan. He worked in the aircraft factory where co-workers displayed unionist political allegiance. There was sectarian graffiti, there were union flag stickers, loyalist tunes were played, and there was numerous other regalia. He raised the matter of the workplace environment with his trade union, and that actually led to increased harassment, during which his management did nothing to support him. The applicant argued that the employer was responsible for the failure, for the harassment due to its failure to act through his supervisor to protect him. And the judicial tribunal found that the applicant had indeed been discriminated against. And that case was of particular significance in that many employers across all sectors revised their arrangements and worked with the trade unions to get the flags and emblems taken down in the workplace and to ensure that sectarian harassment would not be permitted. The tribunal was also prepared to find discrimination where employers had failed to protect the employee from harassment from people outside the workplace, but with whom the applicant comes into contact because of his work. In a case, Smith versus Croft Inns, the applicant, a Roman Catholic bar worker, worked in a bar where the clientele were Protestant and loyalist. He was subjected to threats to his life by his clients, and he asked his employer for a transfer to another bar but no action was taken to respond to his fear. He left the employment and he made a complaint. And the tribunal found that this was unlawful discrimination. The uh, company appealed it to the Court of Appeal, who recognised the difficulties for the employer, but nevertheless, given that they had showed a complete lack of sympathy and concern, upheld the tribunal's finding of discrimination. Of course, we in Northern Ireland and you in Israel will recognise that issues outside the workplace are particularly difficult for an employer to address. I recall one company which had a significant underrepresentation of Roman Catholics. They believed that this was due to a number of factors. First, the plant was very um, close to a housing estate that was hardline loyalist in character and from which they drew a significant number of applicants and employees. And secondly, flags, painted curbstones, etc., on the road leading to the factory, they thought dissuaded Catholic applicants. The company said it was willing to engage in affirmative action, but feared that these other issues associated um, with the workers and the, the flags and curbstones would deter Catholics from applying. We worked with the roads authority to get the flags removed and the curbs cleaned up. 
the, lo the local lawyers community replaced those within a few days. So it wasn't always easy. But in the main, the impact of the tribunal decisions um, was significant. Employers across Northern Ireland began to realise that displays of flags and emblems which they had previously permitted were now interpreted as evidence of discrimination. The Commission following these dis uh, decisions distributed additional guidance and supported employers to work with their employees, their trade unions and others to change the image of the workplace. And at the level of the firm, there have been notable examples of how the composition had changed. I mentioned before the aircraft factory. In 1991, the composition was only 12% Catholic. And despite the fact that it's halved its workplace uh, workforce since, that Catholic share has, has almost doubled. And similarly, in a local carpet ca um, factory where less than 10% of the employees were Catholic, that too has doubled after a change of image. Compulsory religious monitoring, in addition to make it possible to clearly see the change in individual workplaces, has enabled the scrutiny of the sectors and communities as a whole. It's still the case that Roman Catholics are underrepresented in some industries, such as the security industry, but we, increasingly we see that Protestants are underrepresented in areas of public sector employment, especially in health and education. So the provisions now enable us to address that underrepresentation also. But generally speaking, religion no longer independently influences the chances of someone. And that is an important conclusion. And of interest also to you might be that while our strong legal duties were brought in because of the issue of inequality, um, they've actually had um, good um, outcomes on other grounds also. And I sometimes use that phrase, a rising tide lifts all boats. So the, primarily these issues applied to the issue of religion, but if you look, for example, in respect of gender, the female share of senior civil service posts was less than 5% in 1985, before the introduction of compulsory monitoring, but now is in excess of 30%. Um, a number of, uh, of other quality protections which I'd like to quickly mention. Are we okay for time? Um, social clauses and public procurement, that is where the government is buying things from the marketplace. And there is indeed a movement which says that the government should also, when it is buying from the marketplace, buy social justice. Um, we sought to use a number of novel mechanisms to further equality, and one was the use of social clauses and public procurement. For example, a contract that will lead to new employment could also introduce a clause that the long-term unemployed from the local community should get some of the jobs. This idea is not in any way unique to Northern Ireland, and the European Union in particular has for some time been very interested in the benefits of socially responsive procurement. My commission, along with our procurement directorate, jointly published guidance and encouraged public procurement officials to integrate equality and sustainability issues into the procurement process. The guidance was welcomed by many public authorities, although in practice the author um, sometimes there's been um, disappointingly limited use of the facility. And when we ask public authorities why not, they say they're concerned about how they could measure the outcome of social clauses and also about how to incorporate the costs. Um, one of the issues, however, was we recently built a new peace bridge in our um, second city, Londonderry Stroke Derry, where the building contractor and the city council worked together on recruitment and selection and pre-training to assist those in recruiting staff from the long-term unemployed and those who were inactive. And that council and contractor received award for that, uh, an award for that. I think the second thing which I'd like to mention is that we also have special equality duties on the public sector. These are mainstreaming duties which have the aim of challenging and changing the practice of government so that equality and good relations become central to public policy making, policy implementation and service delivery. In terms of these duties, I wanted to let you know the extent to which our equality now drives Northern Ireland. Those mainstreaming duties have been in place since 1999 and they have been important. And finally, I think I'd say one thing about um, our special equality protections, and though that is the issue of the patent reforms. Um, These reforms of the police were indeed 
world recognised and they've been central to our peace process. A former UK government minister, Chris Patton, was asked to bring forward proposals to create a police force more representative of the society it served. And that included the rebranding of the former Royal Ulster Constabulary to the Police Service of Northern Ireland, and it included a wide range of measures to overcome the backdrop of inequality which had characterised the former institution. The Patent Plan was a comprehensive approach. It covered gender equality and actions to build community support, support for policing. So policing would no longer place a community, but place with the community. And a completely revised ethos and culture. It is most known for its approach to ensure proportional religious representation in the composition of police officers. The reforms were largely accepted by the Secretary of State and the temporary recruitment came into place of 50-50. So for all new recruits after the reforms came into place for a short period, period of 10 years, 50% of them would be from the Catholic community and 50% from other. The measures were a real challenge. They were not welcomed by unionist political leaders but nevertheless, they are successful, and that 50-50 has now thankfully come to an end. If I've given you the impression that we in Northern Ireland have solved our sectarian issues, I don't mean to. And I'll say a few words just before I finish about us and our ongoing challenges. Our religious communities remain largely divided. The equality legislation is extensive in terms of the grounds it covers, um, and it's important, but there can be no doubt about the impact which it has had on employment in the workplace. However, despite the significant revision to workplaces, which are now much more integrated in terms of religious composition, there is still considerable segregation of the Protestant and Roman Catholic communities in housing, in schools and colleges, and in social activities. Our success in achieving a resolution to our 30-year-long conflict, which interestingly we call the Good Friday Agreement, has been hailed the world over. However, the religious political divide remains, and we continue to seek a resolution to three key issues, that of flags, parades, and the past. The US Special Envoy, Richard Haas, invested considerable time and effort to try to resolve these matters last winter, but they remained unresolved. Christmas came and he flew home. In more recent weeks, the Northern Ireland Secretary of State, Theresa Villiers, has engaged the political parties in further talks. And two weeks ago, she said, I don't see any chance of a resolution. And then last week, she said, it's getting a bit better. And guess what? We then brought over another US figure, Gary Hart. He arrived in Northern Ireland just last week to lend US support to the process. The Equality Commission is currently wor working with the government to increase our responsibilities so that henceforth we will have responsibility for encouraging, promoting and measuring good relations and so provide a better context for a shared future. I know that the issue of education is a very live one in Israel. So let me tell you about us. In Northern Ireland, our school system remains largely divided. There are two main school systems. The Catholic maintained system, which is very largely for Catholic students. And then the government control system, which is very largely attended by Protestant students. We, like you, have only a small number of integrated schools which serve both religions, so that is Protestant and Roman Catholic. And about 7% of, of all students go to the integrated sector. At second level schooling, that's from about 11 years onwards, most children transfer from all ability primary schools to academically selective second level schools. And the selection is by test, which children compete at 11, and it results in a significant division on social class. Success in academic attainment is significantly influenced by religion, by gender, and by class in Northern Ireland. In terms of religion, Catholic schools, especially Catholic schools for poor children, outperform state schools, especially state schools for poor children. In terms of gender, girls outperform boys. In terms of class, social class, wealthier children outperform poorer children. And the interplay of these three issues results in Protestant boys from poorer backgrounds doing much less well in terms of educational outcomes. 
and in later years, those are likely to be inactive or unemployed, and they're increasingly concerned about that attainment gap between religion and the potential to impact unemployment chances. It is also likely that it is those with very poor qualifications who will be engaged in antisocial um, activities and very much engaged in political protesting. I'll also say a wee bit about poverty and the current recession. In the last five years, Northern Ireland has experienced a considerable recession with a significant drop in our manufacturing and almost complete collapse of the housing market. And we're just kind of starting to come out of that and the housing market's picking up a wee bit. Poverty increased on in all of the measures. And for a considerable number of years, the rate of unemployment, that's those who don't work but are looking for work, was low. But the rate of inactivity, that is those who are not in work and they're not seeking work, was very much higher. Government across the UK has implemented a major programme of welfare reform, which by reducing out-of-work benefits aims to encourage people back to work. The immediate consequence of that reform is to reduce the money available to those who are in welfare benefits, that is, those who are already poor and struggling. The impact of welfare reform is expected to be greater in Northern Ireland than in any other region of the United Kingdom, mainly due to the high dependence and disability benefits. And it's these benefits which are the main target for reform. Northern Ireland is looking at increased poverty in the next few years. Um, in terms of employment inequalities, I'll say one last thing. As I mentioned earlier, for the past decade, the labour market has moved towards greater equality. A notable distinction, however, the, is that the younger age structure of the Catholic community than the, in the Protestant community. So the majority of applicants for employment are Catholic, while the majority of those who leave or retire are Protestant. And for many years, the unemployment rate of Catholics was much greater than that for Protestant. That has now changed, but a particular concern is, as I say, those Protestant males with low academic qualifications. In conclusion, there is no doubt about the significance of the labour market change which has been brought about in Northern Ireland. Strong equality legislation, which I commend to you, effectively enforced, you need a better resource, um, uh, uh, Equal Opportunities Commission, and an economic and social context have all been favourable to change and driven revision. Of course, we have ongoing and sometimes newly emerging challenges, including matters such as greater focus on issues um, for disabled people, concerns about labour market access, and the social isolation of recent migrant workers. But nevertheless, working with others to reduce these socioeconomic inequalities is the central challenge for us, rather than inequality as, uh, on grounds of religion as we move forward. Thank you. Um, thank you very much for this very enlightening talk. It's almost utopian, I think, sometimes when I hear it. It's, um, it's, it's quite uh, some success. Um, I would have been interested in hearing a little bit more about how uh, lessons could be learned from the Irish, uh, Northern Irish um, um, experience uh, in the Israeli Arab or Palestinian uh, Jewish um, experience. Um, I think, you know, um, often I have heard, and I'll make this short, uh, I, I do have a question. Um, often we hear, you know, in Israel, also in academic circles and in policy-making circles that, look, if the Irish could have done it, why can't we do it, right? I mean, we've heard this, I've heard this in many conferences, uh, also abroad. But I would like to uh, suggest and argue that there are some major differences. Just questions. We don't want, we don't have time for, maybe you oh. can continue the discussion. Okay. Sure, okay. So what I'd like to ask then, um, maybe that'll answer my question is, how much is the conflict in Northern Ireland um, a, a religious conflict? Is it a conflict over land? Or is it a conflict um, uh, uh, because I, I, I think there's a, a, a common national... Yes, is it a national, uh, um, uh, uh, you see, Irish feel national, right? Both the Protestants and the religion and, and, the, and the Catholics. In Israel, I'm not sure that is, sh that is the case. So what is the, the, the conflict about, really, in, in Northern Ireland? I think the, the first question about what was the nature of the conflict, is it a conflict about land? 400 years later, it wasn't a conflict about land. 400 years later, 
it was a conflict about the place in society where the Protestant culture was still seemed to be primary, Protestant workers were preferred, and um, Protestant emblems were preferred in the state. So it was uh, it actually at that stage became an issue about place in society. And that's why that element of which we did, which was about place in the workplace, was so important. And, I, and as I say, I'm happy to talk to you separately about the other matters. In relation to the schools issue, um, it is, as I say, a very largely segregated system and they are brought up distinctly. Um, are there opportunities for children to get together? Yes, but they are limited. Um, and in particular, I think what is not um, done is there's not a shared culture so that they have different interests, they have play different football, they um, play different mus musical instruments, they, ha they have very different things. And I think therefore... They don't all go for one direction? <laughs> well, apart from one direction. <laughs> Um, but very often they have very separate interests. So it may well be the case that when um, young people either go to university or those who don't go to university go into the workplace, they're meeting people of a different religion very often for the first time. Thank you. I'm sure we have a, a lot more to learn and maybe we can continue over lunch. Eileen came very far to talk to us, so we really appreciate it. Thank you. And thank you. Thank you.